Uh, so I'd like to start by thanking uh, the organizers um, for this uh, wonderful opportunity to come back to UCLA and to give this talk. So um, Ricardo, Tatiana, Mariel, and uh, <laughs> Federico, many, many thanks. So uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, I have two talks. I'm going to try to give them both. Uh, and they're both about probability. One is a talk about small probabilities. So all speakers were encouraged to spend a few minutes talking about how they got to come to this stage, you know, what's the path of their careers. And so I'm going to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about mine. Uh, and so I title these events with small probabilities. And I give you an example there, OK? Uh, what I mean by small probabilities. You could get soaked wet as you walked out of this building today uh, with rain, right? But the probability is quite small, all right? Now, uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, how I came to this stage by beating the odds uh, with events of small probability. But it would be quite outrageous for me to stand here and tell you that it all happened because of chances, of probabilities, right? So let me read this beautiful statement of Cesar Chavez. We cannot seek achievement for ourselves and forget about progress and prosperity for our community. Our ambitions must be broad enough to include the aspirations and needs of others for their sake and for our own. So I'm here because I encounter, as I move through uh, my early days of education, uh, these incredible individuals who represent this statement at its very, very best. All right, so let me, allow me for one second to boast a little bit uh, and to uh, self-indulge here a little bit with some highlights of my career. So uh, I think I have had a successful career as measured by certain academic uh, um, um, norms, metrics. So I got a bachelor's degree in Santa Cruz in mathematics with honors in the major. By the time I finished the undergraduate degree, I had taken already about a year of graduate mathematics. From there, I went to UC Davis, uh, where I got a Master's of Arts in Teaching and also a teaching credential for high school. Right? So I had a backup plan in case things didn't work out. Right? Uh, from there, I came to UCLA, and I got a PhD, as already has been mentioned, in 1984. Uh, and I was extremely lucky that when I applied for um, postdocs, I got about 10 offers, including some from very, very good departments. And I chose to go to Caltech. And I had a wonderful advisor here, Richard Durrett, who encouraged me and was very kind and generous in writing letters for me, even up to today. Uh, at Caltech, I had another wonderful postdoc, Professor Tom Wool, who was not any much younger, much older than I was but who was also an outstanding harmonic analyst. And from them, I learned enormously a lot. I applied in 1986 to uh, tenure track jobs, and I got many offers, including many from very, very good departments, and including two from two outstanding departments here in California, one uh, department just a little bit across the border, and the other one not too far from the state capital. Right? So that was quite wonderful. Uh, but I chose to go to Illinois on a postdoc. From there, I moved to Purdue in 1987. I was promoted to full pro associate professor in 89, two years after I arrived there, and to full professor in 92, just five years after I received my PhD. This is by no means a world record, but it is a 46 year, I am in the three, three fastest promotions in 46 years at Purdue. All right. I have been invited to lecture on my research at every continent except Antarctica. Never been there. Uh, I have received my fair share of recognitions and awards. And here is one that is very, very much uh, one that I enjoy very much because of what it means to our communities, right? These honors um, the legacy of two giants in our field, two individuals who have devoted and who personalize also this statement of Cesar Chavez at his best. Uh, here is me and Mark uh, at the award ceremony. Uh, I had less gray hair, and so did Mark. Uh, here I am uh, with my mom, who was in early stages of Alzheimer's. She came to the uh, ceremony. My sister 
my nephew Marco and my sister Elsa. And we very much enjoy that. I put this picture here to remind you of a couple of things, especially the young people. And see, this talk is really about, for, for, for those of you that are not, uh, that are still moving up in the profession. Uh, maybe we all are, actually. But in any case, uh, I think uh, I myself have always enjoyed having my family, my familia, uh, be part of my successes and also my failures, and particularly about my failures, because ultimately your family is the one that is going to lift you up and bring you around when things don't go so well. All right, uh, now let me tell you the early years. I was born in La Masita in the state of Zacatecas. This was a farming community, a campesino community. My parents never attended college. I was one of eight children, the second oldest. Life as a child, I worked in the fields, in the, in, the, in the farm, right? I never went to school. But people there thought I was inteligente. I have no idea why, but they thought so, all right? My family moved to the U.S. in 1970. I was two months, we arrived in April, mid-April. I was two months short of my 16th birthday, all right? I had never gone to school. So because of my age, they put me on ninth grade, hmm? right? And now, this was April, and then I graduated from middle school, you know, junior high school, in June. Do you think I learned anything? Absolutely not, okay? Nothing, right? But I graduated and my family celebrated, <laughs> right? I was a complete fraud. And then I went through three more years of moving from grade 10 to 11 to 12. In 1973, all and behold, I graduated from high school. Did I learn anything? Absolutely not, <laughs> right? All right, so then I got a job at a car wash. Well, I have had it for quite a number of years, and something magical happened there. The car wash you see is called um, Arroyo Parkway Car Wash, and it is on its way from UCLA to Pasadena City College. And there uh, at the car wash, Francisco Lara, who was a graduate student at UCLA, he was teaching a course in Chicano Studies at Pasadena City College, and he would stop to wash his car. And he encouraged me, after many conversations, to come to Pasadena City College and take his course on Chicano Studies. And I did, all right? So I spent, because of Juan Lara and all his encouragement, I spent one year, one year and two summers at Pasadena City College. And I took Algebra one. this is ninth grade algebra, Algebra two, 10th grade, and I tri took trigonometry and a couple of courses in English and uh, even Spanish, right? Because remember, I didn't go to school, so my Spanish was no better than my English in some sense, right? Now this is interesting because, you know, if you're very well educated in Spanish, the challenge of learning English is not as bad, right? Okay? So, there I am, right? So from there, uh, I went to, uh, uh, I applied, you know, so here's something interesting, in 1974 I applied, and was rejected by all the campuses of the UC system, UCLA included. And I don't blame him for rejecting me. I think I would have died anywhere in one of the campuses here. But Francisco Lara had no interest in accepting rejection, and so he hooked me up with this fellow, Ruben Rubalcaba, at UC Santa Cruz, who was the director of special action. Okay, this, is, this was the same as affirmative action. So. You want to know something? I am a product of affirmative action, right? A proud product of affirmative action. All right, so then I went to Santa Cruz, and in Santa Cruz I met Jean Cotarrobles and Frank Talamantes. They were both founding members of SAGNAS. In those days, SAGNAS was just starting. There is a fame, a very, very distinguished fellowship by the, the University of, 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 of California, campus-wide, named after Jean Cotarrobles. Jean had come from, University, from Pennsylvania State the year earlier, the year before I went to Santa Cruz. Uh, they were both microbiologists, not mathematicians, but they were tremendously encouraging. And there I also met Anthony Trumba and Edward Lendesman, 
and they were taught me calculus, and they were the first people to tell me I had mathematical ability. So I graduated from Santa Cruz in 1978, and I applied to graduate school, and I was accepted to two, to many, many, se several, not that many, because I didn't apply to many, but I was accepted to two, to several top programs, including two in the state of California. One at a place not too far from San Francisco, and the other one at a place not too far from San Jose. Huh? All right, but UCLA, you know what? They went on with me. So here's a letter that I'd like to take a moment to read to you, all right? So what does this letter say? This letter is 40 years, one month, and nine days old, right? And it is addressed to me at Crown College, University of California, Santa Cruz. Dear Mr. Bañuelos, your application for admission to graduate studies at UCLA for the fall semester, for the fall term of 1978, has been evaluated by the Graduate Admissions Office and reviewed by the department in which you wish to study. The Department of Mathematics, however, has not recommended your admission. Regrettably, therefore, we must inform you that we shall not be able to extend you an acceptance into the graduate division. Should you have any questions re regarding the department decision, we suggest that you consult with your department, with the department graduate advice, uh, admissions advisor. We are sorry that we could not act favorably upon your application, but we thank, thank you for your uh, in, interest in graduate studies at UCLA. Uh, we hope further that you take, that you will be able to take advantage of other arrangements to continue your education, right? Wonderful letter. And so I decided that I should take advantage to continue my education. There's my PhD from UCLA, right? <laughs> With all the rights and privilege, right, awarded in Los Angeles, right? Well, you know, all is well that ends well, and life is full of turns and twists, right? Okay. So, let me go on. I don't think I'm on target here. And now do the second part of these uh, random walks into various talks. Let me see if I am able to put this in full view. Uh, where do I do this? View. view. Full screen. OK. Well, there it is, the second part of this talk, probability and geometry, looking for randomness in all the wrong places. So I arrived here in 1984, in 84, and that year, Johnny Lee recorded his famous tune, looking for love in all the wrong places. And I, myself, came here to study partial differential equations in geometry. And I took a course in probability, beginning probability with Rick Durat, and then I started looking for randomness in all the wrong places. Now, the probability, let me just define what probability is for you. Well, this is a very vague definition. Probability is an area of mathematics used to model many disciplines in science, engineering, social science, business, et cetera, where a phenomena has uncertainty. Randomness is present. This talk, however, it takes it in the other direction. We look at things that are quote unquote deterministic, they have no randomness in them, and we look for randomness and try to get intuition on how to uh, make progress on various problems. Okay? The problems in this area here belong to the general theory of spectral theory, viral asymptotics, and eigenvalue estimates. All right? So the problems, the two classical problems. So this is a very general talk with very little um, mathematical formulas and very little mathematical jargon, but there is some, as we cannot really give talks. So there are two classical problems plus one other problem, and I will say all deeply rooted in our common experiences and intuition. And intuition. This is not, I put it in quote, because it's not an original statement of any kind. Uh, but the first pro problem is a classical problem, and the problem is, to maximize a region, uh, maximize the area of a region subject to fixed perimeter. This is a problem that was discovered more than 3,000 years ago, all right? And was solved, in fact, quote unquote, 
at that time, by that time also. The second problem is the big drums produce low tones and small drums produce high tones. This was discovered the very first time a human being ever played with drums, right? It is, doesn't require any knowledge of mathematics. The other problem is to maximize the lifetime of a brainless bug hmm, that is crawling around in a region that has killing boundary, a killing boundary, okay? So the, the, as soon as the bug gets close to the, to the boundary, it's zapped, it dies. Hmm? Don't, 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 don't take it so seriously. Randomness arises in problem three, and each solution actually solves problem one and two. But that's not all, because those problems are very old. It gives insights, insights into problems that are of current interest and that are much more difficult to solve, right? Okay, so let me just walk you through these problems. So the proof problem is called in mathematics the isoparametric inequality. This was discovered by Quinn Dido, a Phoenician princess from the city of Tyre, which is now Lebanon, right? Uh, upon her arrival in Africa, 1800 or 1900 BC. And here is what it states, okay? Again, completely, completely trivial, right? Amongst all figures of equal perimeter, the circle encloses the largest area. An equivalent formulation is this dual formulation presented by Euler uh, in the 1700s, that amongst all regions of equal area, that this has the smallest perimeter. You see, the story goes that smart farmers used to cheat the, those that were not so clever by measuring the size of their field, right, by the time that it took to walk around them, right? Now imagine this. This was real, really very clever uh, a trick, right? Because you could walk forever and then just make one step over and walk back, and, and the amount of area that you will enclose, there will not be very much, much, much land to plant anything, right? And on the other hand, if you took a circle, hmm, then, of course, uh, you know, the time to walk around, it was very small, but the area could be very large, right? So, so this, is, this, is, uh, this was a nasty trick. Now, Queen Dido, uh, who lost her husband to her um, uh, brother, who chopped his head off, um, fled, uh, fled and went to, to the coast of Africa, which is now uh, Tunisia. Hmm? And she arrived uh, uh, in, 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 in what is now Tunis. Uh, um, and she negotiated for land with the local king. And the king said, my queen, you can have as much land as you want if you marry me. And she said, I have no interest in marrying you. Hmm? So she rejected him. And then the local king tried to make it even more difficult for her. And she, he, he said, you can have as much land as you can enclose with the hide of an ox, right? The skin of an ox. So, there they are, you see, they're cutting the skin, and what did she do? She had her people, right, enclose a half a circle, a semicircle using the coastline as the other boundary, right? So she actually solved a problem that is even more difficult than the one that she stated earlier, or that we stated earlier in terms of the circle, right? It's actually a little bit more difficult, but she solved the problem. Now, this kind of idea, of course, has been used over and over and over through the centuries, right? To construct cities, to build cities that have a lot of living space and not as much boundary because they were interested in defending the walls, right? Defending from, 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 from uh, 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 the armies that were coming in. So maximize space, living space. There's a map of uh, Paris, a medieval map of Paris. Uh, but let me tell you now the mathematical formulation of the isoparametric inequality. Well, I just rewrite in words in mathematics what I just said before. You take a region in the plane, and of course they, they can be in any dimension, right? A fixed area, and you take a disk, right? They call it D star, and this is the disk, and you want the area of the disk to be the same as the area of D, and the isoparametric inequality says that the perimeter is minimized by the disk. Okay? So this is a classical isoparametric inequality. And the other part is that equality holds if and only if D itself is a disk. Hmm? So amongst all regions of equal area, the perimeter is minimized by the disk. It holds for domains in higher dimensions and many other geometric settings, such as manifolds, and 
here is where the probability comes in, diffusions, and either in infinite dimensions, whatever that means, right? On winter space, for example, hmm? something that is used in probability. Let me rewrite it mathematically, and you can see that if you write it mathematically, you have no intuition. You lost the sense of, of, of deeply rooted in our common experiences, right? There you need mathematics. So let's take R to be the radius of the disk of same area. That means that the area is pi R squared. So this is something that everybody learns in high school and that I learned in college, right? right? Okay, and let's find out how big is R. Well, we also must require the pi R squared be equal to the area of D. And so the perimeter, of course, is 2 pi r, which is equal to 2 pi. You see from here, you see that, uh, that uh, r itself is the square root of area of d over pi. So here is the area, the, 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 the perimeter. And then you go up here, you square both sides, and then you solve, or you rearrange, and you see this is the classical statement of the isoparametric inequality. You know, I told my daughters one day, I have two wonderful daughters, right? Uh, who are grown up women with very nice careers and wonderful people. Uh, but I told them the isoparametric inequality in the way that Dido dis discovered it, and they immediately conjecture it. If I had told them these, they would have never even be, have any interest, right? So this is one of the things about mathematics. Mathematics is a living thing. It is done by people. It is, comes from intuition, whatever level, right? But when we do these formulas, it scares people, and it gives phobia to many people. And certainly our community has experienced a lot of that, right? So um, this I do not find as attractive. Hmm? But this is the isoparametric inequality, and in higher dimensions, it's got, it's got um, some factors there that involve gamma functions, and it's even uglier, right? But you can also, of course, write it down. All right, now here is, uh, for those of you who ever try anything by induction, here is Descartes' proof of the isoparametric inequality, right? So here is the uh, statement uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, po George Polia in this book, book, popular book, uh, uh, Mathematics and Plausible uh, Reasoning. Uh, it says, uh, the isoparametric inequality deeply rooted in our experience and intuition, so easy to conjecture but not so easy to prove, is an inexhaustible, inexhaustible source of inspiration, right? And both, all three problems here are inspired by this isoparametric inequality. All right, so here is what Descartes did, all right? So Polya says that in Descartes we find the following interesting statement. So this is, uh, uh, this, is this book, uh, which is called The Rules of the Direction of the Mind, which, by the way, must be recognized as one of the classical works in the logic of discovery we find the following curious passage. In order to show by enumeration that the perimeter of a circle is less than that of any other figure of the same area, we do not need to completely survey all possible figures, but it is sufficient to prove this for a few particular figures when, whence we can conclude the same thing by induction for all the others. And so what Descartes did, he checked, I don't know. Look, there's a circle, he wrote them down. 3.55, the square one, of the square of, of area one, four, and so on and so forth, right? And then he concluded, we're done. Well, that's a wonderful, that, now Descartes, but nobody told Descartes at that time, right? So now if we have a student and we give him a problem and they check five cases, we tell him, you are absolutely wrong, right? And then we drive this fear in their hearts then mathematics must always have a right answer, right? But nobody told Descartes that he was wrong and that he was quote unquote stupid, right? right? But he had this proof that of course was wrong. And but the isoparametric inequality was proved later. Now here we go on to the second problem. The second problem says that if you have small drums, then small drums produce very, very high tones, right? Yeah, take a tambourine, right? You hit it, bing, right? Okay, and this is something that we also have in our intuition, right? In our intuition, common experiences. So there is a large drum, and this drum produces a high tone, hmm? high tone, 
pom, as you hit it, right? So let me tell you, I wrote some papers on drums. Well, not really, but I wrote some papers on eigenvalues of the Laplacian, which is what we're talking about here, many years ago. And again, I always wanted to share with my daughters what I was doing. So my daughter, one of them was in um, third grade, and the other one was in first grade. And so I told them, OK, listen, here's what I'm working on. You are on the other room, and I'm here. And I have a drum, and you have not seen it, right? And I strike it, and you hear it. And you hear, boom, right? Or you hear, bing, right? Which one do you think will be small, and which one do you think will be large? And then you know what they said? Dad, we knew that since we were in kindergarten. <laughs> Are you really working on that? <laughs> so this is, this is the, the incredible intuition from here, right? All right, now at Purdue, we claim to have the world's largest drum. You see, world's largest drum, right? In other words, the drum that produces the lowest fundamental tone, right? And you know what? They're wrong, and they've been wrong for a long time, right? There's a beautiful drum in one of those temples in Kyoto where you can visit, and it used to be the case that they allowed you to come close enough that you can strike it, right? Now, uh, here I had a little, um, uh, some other picture, right, to illustrate uh, uh, the, 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 the theory of hearing the, the, the shape of a drum, right? But in, uh, in order to save time, I think I'm going to proceed and not show that. All right. Now, why is it that there's mathematics in hearing the shape of a drum, quote unquote? Because of the wave equation. So if you take a plane, then there is a sequence, plane region or any region, a finite area, then there's sequ a sequence of positive numbers, right? So the, the D gives you a sequence of positive numbers. These are called the eigenvalues, right? And a sequence of functions, right? And the functions solve this, uh, this, uh, this differential equation uh, in, in the region. And actually, the functions are zero on the boundary, but we're not going to worry about that. The numbers are actually increasing, and they're marching out to infinity. Hmm? So if you take these for, uh, as a given, and you consider this function, the function times e to the i square root of lambda jt, these eigenvalues, these, eigenval these functions solve the wave equation. right? And so these are the pure tones of the drum. So when you strike the drum, the wave comes through, and you hit your ear, and you hear the sound, right? Okay. So this is what we mean by hearing the shape of a drum, right? All right. So here are a couple of drums. There's a rectangular rum, drum, and the rectangular drum you can write the eigenfunctions, and particularly the lowest one, explicitly the signs, products of signs, and here's the eigenvalue. Now let me let B go out to infinity, just for illustration here. And you notice that this number goes to zero, and the eigenvalue is just the eigenvalue of the one-dimensional interval, right? So there are drums which have positive lowest eigenvalue, right? The fundamental tone, which have infinite area, OK? So here is the circle. On the circle, you can solve a problem. This is a problem that is solved in differential equations, you know, second year of college, all right? Uh, and it is given by the Bessel function, the zero of the Bessel function, and you can compute the eigenvalue, and it happens to be some number, which is the zero of a Bessel function divided by the area of the, of the region, right? So you can see here, if the area is extremely, extremely large, then in fact, lambda is zero, right? Going again with our intuition. Low drums, the bigger the drum, the lower the tone, hmm? okay? Now, so here is uh, the second ISO area uh, problem, OK? And this is a ve very famous theorem that was proven in 1920 by um, Faber and Koran. And the uh, theorem says that, uh, that if you know the uh, eigenvalue for the disk, then you take two regions of the same area then the disk minimizes the eigenvalue, right? So amongst all drums, all drums of fixed area, the circular one minimizes the tone. Hmm? So this is, again, a result which is 
um, uh, very much in our intuition. But you know, you can have also inf inf drums of infinite area where the lowest tone is positive. So the volume or the area is not the determining factor to have a positive lower eigenvalue. And turns out that as what I was working at the time uh, or earlier on in the 90s was a theorem that sharpens this result and I state it here. So the theorem says that if you take any region and you take the largest disk that you can put in there, then the eigenvalue of the region is comparable to the eigenvalue for this disk, right? So if you take an infinite strip, you take a unit disk or, or, or an infinite strip of unit width, then you take a disk, a unit disk, and the eigenvalue is in fact comparable to that, right? So this is a much more precise result than that. Uh, and in fact, one even has things that, that go with constants. All right, now, let me tell you about the third problem that is not a classical problem, but they will solve both of them. And this is the problem about Brownian motion. So Brownian motion, let me attempt to give you a picture of Brownian motion. So Brownian motion was observed by um, uh, Robert Brown 1927, when studying particles moving in water, right, pollen moving in water. And he observed that the molecules from the water give this, this, this pollen particle lots of bombardments, and the particles experience this jittery motion, which is now called Brownian motion. So if things go the way they're supposed to, then this will give you a picture of Brownian motion. This is not my uh, construction. It's an applet that I stole uh, from, uh, from this fellow with, and I made a few trivial modifications. So there's a particle, there's the molecules of the fluid, and the fluid is completely, completely homogeneous, right? So the particle just moves around. And the particle runs around here, and what I could do, when it reaches the boundary, I could kill it by stopping it, all right? Okay? So this is Brownian motion. All right, so this was uh, found by Mr. Brown, uh, and uh, you know, Yesterday, Ryan Hyde said about Mr. Monch that he looked kind of serious. To me, these guys look kind of grumpy. Uh, but anyways, that's, 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 that's Brown. They, uh, now it doesn't seem to want to move. All right, so they, they uh, hmm, let's see. What happened here? Oh. Okay, now the mathematical formulation of, of Brownian motion was made by, Robert, uh, by, by Albert Einstein in 1905, in the special paper on special uh, the paper on special relativity, and what uh, Albert Einstein said is the Brownian motion should have independent increments. Now this is a very very natural conjecture, right? So the fluid is completely homogeneous. So if you look at an increment of Brownian motion over here, it should be completely independent of what happened over here, right? Uh, it should have no memory, also because the fluid is completely homogeneous, and so wherever you are, it doesn't know where it's been, hmm? okay? Uh, and it had, should have continuous trajectories, and the trajectories should have uh, a normal distribution, all right? So this was the formulation, and it was proved by Norbert Wiener in 1923 in a title which has kind of mischievous title because Brownian motion does not have differentiable paths. So how, what, what title did Winner give to this paper? Differentiable space, right? Just to confuse. But what he proved is that in fact, Brownian motion exists, so there exists a stochastic process which has a normal distribution. In other words, if you wanna know the probability that the particle moves from point Z naught to point Z in time T, it is given by the normal distribution. The distribution that we all love and use and misuse, right, in mathematics and in statistics, okay, because the normal distribution arises after taking millions and millions and millions of samples, adding them up, and what is often done is that they take 25 samples and they say, it's normal. Hmm? Well, you know, this is quite far from normal, but we are not gonna go into that. What I'm gonna observe here is that if you take this function, right? So it is here where the geometry and the properties of solutions of, 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 of PDEs and so on 
connect with probability, right? This is the place where we, 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 we light the fireworks and, uh, and um, 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 Roll the drums, as they say, okay? So you take the function f, and you average it along the Brownian path, and you take this definition, uh, use some basic formulas, and then you show that this function, in fact, solves the heat equation. Now, once you get to the heat equation, then do you do some tricks, and you get to the wave equation, right? But let me tell you, uh, and this, by the way, is a universal principle. So if you have a stochastic um, a process that goes with some kind of distribution, some kind of um, uh, um, probabilities that are natural, sort of fundamental solutions of PDEs, then there is this connection, okay? So that's where the connection arises. Now, here is the third problem, which I told my daughters, and they also thought I was kidding when I told them I was studying this problem, okay? So now think of this bug, right? In, an, in, a, in, this, uh, in this region of fixed area. Hmm? And you want to start somewhere, anywhere in here, and the bug is gonna die after it reaches this boundary, right? After it reaches this boundary. Now, where should this brainless bug start? So it's got the fixed area, right? Same area, and what the bug wants to do, right? What this particle wants to do is maximize its lifetime. Tell me, what would you vote for? This? No. That one, right? And where should you start? As far as you can from the boundary, which is the origin, right? The origin, right? So here's a theorem, all right? So this is the isoparametric Brownian motion, isoparametric property of Brownian motion kill on the boundary. So the probability, regardless of where you start, if you're in any region D, right, is maximized by the disk of same area. Mm -hmm. But furthermore, you have all sorts of other inequalities. And then you have an inequality that gives you geometry, right? So I'm not going to explore this. But because of this inequality, right, which now on the left-hand side has probability and on the right-hand side has geometry, on the left-hand side has probability and on the right-hand side has the information of the drum, you see, because of this, and this previous inequality that everything is maximized by the disk of same volume, you get the classical isoparametric inequality. So this one contains the classical isoparametric inequality. This one contains the favor Koran inequality on the eigenvalue. And this one, of course, uh, uh, and also, of course, solves the isoparametric inequality for Brownian motion. So this theorem is the key, right? Right? So the probability that the Brownian particles alive by time t is starting from z, that is, this function holds many, many secrets. Although on the surface, it did not hold the secret of the isoparametric inequality. It did not hold the secret of the eigenvalue, the, 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 the here and how big the, uh, the drum is, right? But now we know, right? So the heart of the matter, however, is not that but rather a deeper inequality on the finite dimensional distributions of Brownian motion. And once one proves that, one actually says, now what did I use about Brownian motion? And one can actually extend it to something which I call Levy processes. So Paul Levy, about 10 years after, uh, maybe less than 10 years after um, Norbert Wiener constructed Brownian motion, he said, what would happen if we remove the assumption of continuity from Brownian motion, right? In other words, you have some fluid, and every once in a while, this particle encounters something hidden from below, and he makes a jump. Hmm? What happens? Then he constructed what I call Levy process, and it turns out that this is a rich area of probability, okay? And it is no longer connected to the Laplacian, hmm? right? So, but one can prove theorems for that. Now, let me tell you uh, one of the pioneers of this subject uh, on uh, the use of Brownian motion to study all sorts of um, phenomena where you don't see randomness. Uh, it was Mark Katz, uh, who was a Polish mathematician who wrote beautiful papers uh, and used a principle 
the principle of not feeling the boundary, okay? And mathematically speaking, what this means is that for very, very small time, the Brownian motion does not see the boundary. So the mechanism, the heat kernel, the transition probabilities, right, for the kill process are the same as the one for the whole entire space where we know very explicitly what it looks like, even if we do not know what it looks like in a region, right? And so he wrote it in a paper, an expository paper that appeared in the Mathematical Monthly, and he put it as follows. As the Brownian particles begin to diffuse, they are not aware, so to speak, of the disaster that awaits them upon reaching the boundary, right? Now, you know, for young people, life is infinite. <laughs> All right. Now, the above are classical problems. I haven't told you anything new here, right? right? Well, I told you a, new, a few new theorems, right? But the problems, the two problems are classical problems, and even the problem on the, on the, on the, on the area, on the, on the lifetime of the Brownian motion uh, has been around for the last 10 years or so. Uh, and so what is happening right now? Now, let me tell you a little bit of what's happening right now, and then I'm going to end, and I think I'm going to uh, uh, be on time. So Mark Cox in 1966 proved, uh, uh, wrote a paper, can one hear the shape of a drum? And the answer turned out to be no, right? You can hear how big, but how big is a very vague statement, right? What does it mean by big, okay? Well, you can hear how, 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 how big it is because we proved a theorem this doesn't have the area, okay? So we, we, have, we have some notion of bigness there, very precise. But uh, is it, is, can, 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 what, so what geometric uh, quantities can you hear, right, from these eigenvalues, from the sequence of numbers? Well, one can hear its area, its perimeter, one can also hear the number of holes, and one can also hear curvature and various other things. But you cannot completely determine the region just from the sequence of numbers that is produced, right? You can have two regions with the same spectrum that come with the same, that produce the same spectrum, yeah? So somebody hands you this number and you cannot say, oh yeah, with absolute certainty, this is the region that produced them, right? All right, so then this is this, uh, 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 well, these problems was actually, were actually motivated by a conjecture uh, made by a mathematical, uh, by a physicist uh, Henrik Anton Lorenz uh, in a series of lectures that he gave at Gottenham, uh, and he said, look, these numbers are going to infinity. At what rate are they going? And it turns out that his conjecture was that is the area divided by 4 pi, and there's some error turn. Uh, and um, David Hilbert was in the audience for this lecture, and so was um, Weil, who was a student of Hilbert. And Hilbert said, these will not be proved in my lifetime. And then his student, Herman Weil, proved him wrong the next year because Hilbert um, passed away sometime in the 40s, right? So he missed it by many, many years. And Weil made the conjecture that, in fact, you can hear the perimeter also. And this conjecture lasted many years, and it was proved in 1980 by Melrose, by, by Ivry and, and Melrose. Uh, and they proved that, in fact, you have the second term asymptotics, which has the perimeter. And there's a lot of research. This is much finer than just here in the shape. You want to know at what rate are these numbers marching out to infinity, right? Okay? Uh, and what geometric properties can you get from the asymptotic expansion of such, a, such an object? Now, so what is the current area of research, right? The current area of research that is quite interesting and, and it has been quite hot uh, in both in probability and in analysis and PDE, Caffarelli and many of his students and co-workers and so on have worked a lot on these problems. And this is the so-called fractional Laplacian non-local operators, right? So for every lambda between alpha between zero and two, you write this operator, which looks very, very strange, but turns out that as soon as alpha is equal to two, you actually get back the Laplacian, right? So this is, a, this is a, 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 a operators that very naturally extend the Laplacian. The geometric analytic properties of these operators have been extensively studied in recent years in both analysis, probability, geometry, applied mathematics, and, and various other areas, okay? Because they are related to these processes with jumps, okay? And in the real world, 
if you look at the stock market, turns out Brownian motion is not a thing to use. Where is uh, Ryan? He's sleeping. Oh, there you are, right? <laughs> you should use stable processes of certain degree, right? So you should use the fractional Laplacian. Uh, turns out that it gives you better and even, even more general than that. So now, many spectral questions, of course, for this operator are also around. But let me just end here with one, right? So you, who wants to be the Laplacian? Stacy, you be the Laplacian. You are alpha equal two. Hmm? And you have an uncountable number of friends, right? Called alphas, hmm? huge number. And you go and you buy alpha microphones, uh, 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 earphones. Hmm? And you give Tatiana 0.9, alpha equal 0.9, Earphone, and you give everybody, right? Everybody gets a, gets a, gets a, an alpha phone, right? And then you put the drum next door, right? And you strike it, or somebody strikes it. Hmm? And then you go and you said to Mrs. Mr. Miss Alpha earphone, what did you hear? Did you hear the same thing that I heard? You know, and until last year the alpha person could say that the only thing they heard was the area. Or, well, of course, the only thing that they could distinguish was the area. And you say, ah, but I can hear much more. I can hear the perimeter, I can hear the number of holes, and I can hear various other, various other things. And then, turns out that we proved not too long ago that, in fact, you could hear also the perimeter, right? So now, Stacy goes to somebody else with another alpha, and you say, well, what did you hear? And the answer will be, I heard the area, and I heard the perimeter. Hmm? And then very recently, somebody discovered that the alpha person right, with the alpha earphone can hear things that Alpha equal two, Stacy with her Laplacian um, earphones cannot hear. You can hear the levy measure. You can hear something which is called the alpha perimeter, and you can hear various other things. But how different is the spectrum of, is different. The question is what geometric quantities can you get out of this, 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 this alpha uh, um, um, Laplacians. The alpha Laplacians go exactly as the Laplacian goes with Brownian motion, go with something that is called symmetric stable processes that have been studied. But of course, this is not the end of the story. There are many, many questions, and you can actually study these problems for many other um, uh, processes, levy processes, which are also of, of, of interest in many different areas. All right, so, muchas gracias. <laughs>